questions and we have a voice. <laughs> awesome. So we are back for the last plenary session of today. Perhaps a quick recap. Uh, which parallel session uh, did you listen to? What were kind of the key takeaways? I was behind the bar listening to the parallel session on how potentially the relationship of patients and HCPs could be changing because of um, the digitalization. And we've had some really good remarks on how face-to-face -face should become and still um, be the gold standard, but it definitely has a lot of enables for this relationship to evolve. What happened in your session, Tiasha? So I was in a session about the upcoming electronic product mm -hmm. information. So instead of looking at paper leaflets of medications, it will soon be possible for patients to access electronic information of medications. So no matter where in Europe you pick up a medication from the pharmacy, you can access the information about that medication in your own language and in a semi-structured way. So that's something to look for over to for better patient empowerment and really knowing more about the medications that you're taking. Definitely sounds cool. And because we are just two and we had three parallel sessions, I only heard some rumors about the AI one, but it was said to be really fun. Maybe some feedback on that, yeah? And you played a game I've heard and it will be repeated. So stay tuned for anyone who missed it. Yeah, and our next session is actually again about AI, more specifically the ethics of AI. We've heard a lot about the upcoming improvements in terms of data in Europe, the planned accessibility across Europe, interoperability, um, and data processing for researchers when data is anonymized. So many promising advancements. However, when we talk about data and AI, there's also a lot of ethical questions involved in the debates from the fact that algorithms can be biased if the data is not clean, from the debates about who has the financial gain when algorithms are developed. So I really am curious to hear what our panelists in the next session will tell us about the relation between ethics and AI. Me too. It will be a very cool interview style um, conversation followed by a Q&A, so you will have a chance to ask questions. It will be moderated by Anka Toma, the Executive Director of the European Patients Forum. And we have two interviewees. One is Victoria Pronteor, <laughs> who uh, is a patient advocate. And we have Dimitrios Atanosiu, who is the EP, a board member of both EPF and the World Duchenne's organization. So we would like to kindly invite the three speakers to the stage and do take it away with the discussion. Big applause. Thank you. And um, I already brought my stuff. And welcome to this last plenary session of today. Uh, we've already been introduced, and because it's not the longest session in this, um, in this Congress, we're going to get straight to it. Uh, so my first question in this interview is Victoria Dimitrios. Do patients share their data for AI? And when they do, why do they share their data for AI? What are their hopes, their dreams, their expectations, their fears? That's a very good question. Should I start, Dimitri? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, um, I think, and um, that's what we already heard today, I think they would like to share their data. But right now, it's not really that easy to share their data. Um, at least not if you want to do it in an electronic way. Because just to give you an example, um, during my uh, personal diagnosis, um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2019. All the data was, which was collected then, I had to put in one folder, right? And uh, put it in the drawer at home. So there isn't really an electronic health record. So uh, even if I want to share, and I'm I'm definitely 
open to share my data under certain circumstances if other patients would benefit from it. But I'm not really able to share it at the moment. Dimitrios, what's your take on this? Well, I have various folders in various countries. I come from a rare disease, so there is a folder somewhere in many countries of my son that has to send. So, yeah, I would like to share the data on a principle. And I think from our community, from rare diseases, we know that something like 90% of our people would like to share the data because they might have a chance to live. So it is essential to share your data. The problem is how to share it, when to share it, and what is the added value. So everybody is asking for my son's data, for example. But what do I get back from that? Do I improve his care? Do I improve the pathway of uh, the rest of the community? Do I contribute to research? Do I see the research publications? Do I know what is the impact of my son's data, even after that he's not there, which is still useful data when you're talking about these kind of diseases? Uh, and do the data that it is used was published at the end? Mm -hmm. Because the experience we have so far is that everybody is mining my data and they're not sharing the data. So we're having a continuous of silos. And I think out of our 7,000 rare diseases, we have 5% kind of treatments. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point you were just mentioning, um, because a lot of data is in silos. I think today we heard often patients should share, patients want share, but what, the, what is with all the others who are hoarding the data, right? I mean, there's so much data siloed within hospitals, within research institutions, but also within uh, corporates, right? Um, so I think they also have a responsibility if we talk about innovation and if we want to make something better for the patient, then everyone has to share their data. Yeah, maybe, maybe I, I take it from there because it's very interesting uh, when you, we're talking about silos and especially on, a, on AI and especially when we, we want this, let's say, machinery, this system to be taught, to be, we need good quality of data. And this is a, we are in an environment that everything changes very fast. So the standard of care of breast cancer, even in Duchenne, that it's slower, let's say, it's changing by, by weeks, by months. So if you use the old data, of another disease trajectory, how can it inform you now? How it will inform you in the next day? So it has to be a continuous pathway. But I think it's more a mental uh, pathway that you have to build. And uh, definitely, uh, we need all the stakeholders, most probably, around the same table. I was very impressed by the presentation of uh, the commission that I didn't see our patient organizations anywhere. I think even in a slide deck, it tells you a lot. Maybe. If it's okay, <laughs> go. On. I, I I think I can just like move away now and let you guys do it. <laughs> I just want to add something to your point of quality. Um, you know, quality or let's say also comprehensiveness, inclusi inclusivity of data. Um, because I was a very young patient, a very young breast cancer patient. And a lot of the, the studies and research is based on um, people in a later stage in their life, you know, and, and there are different needs depending on the, on your age or, um, yeah, there are different needs and it's, it's um, often not involved in the data which is used to train artificial intelligence. Can I ask you on that? We're talking a lot about data. I mean, we're here at this Congress talking about data. Can you explain for, you know, someone like me who doesn't really know, what is the pathway of data from the patient and where into decision making? Uh, and where is artificial intelligence? Where does it come in in this, this whole pathway for the patient? Go ahead, I'll start with Victoria and then I'll ask Dimitrios. Okay, that's, yes. a, 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 I think it's a very interesting question um, because it also includes the question where does medical data even start, right? I mean, um, right now or at the moment, the um, 
when 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 I myself recognize that there is a that there is a lump and I have to go to the doctor, then this was the point where um, the medical system started to collect my data. So, for example, my my age, my my gender. Um, specifics about the cancer, um, image data, so um, ultrasound, um, CT scan, um, and all that stuff. But um, maybe what I'd like to, to add here, of course there was a period of time, maybe two weeks before I went to the doctor, where I started my, my research about symptoms. And I, I used mainly Google search. And um, I'm sometimes wondering if this um, maybe is already or should be already part of a medical record or history. Maybe, maybe I'll pick it up from there. And I'm not going to answer you exactly in your question, but I'm going to move it a little further. Because what kind of data you are using for artificial intelligence, there is a big discussion about social media data, about data that and knowledge that's already generated somewhere that we don't know. But if we move it a little further, is also, you know, this AI data that we want to, to collect, uh, who is going to benefit out of it at the end? So for, at least for the patient advocacy groups, I mean, we try to collect our data, and we try to see, because we try also to persuade our own people to donate the data for the research, our own families, which is not given even if you have a terminal disease. It doesn't mean that you're going to donate the data. Uh, you have to train our people, you have to educate our people, we have to find the importance. But the most important is, I mean, the first meeting we had, when we were completely naive about data, it's what is there for me. It was our consultant. Say, what, what means there for you? It's altruistic, it's for the good of the society, for the benefit of the world. Yeah, it didn't fly. So we have to have a very specific value proposition and I think depending on the condition sometimes, the pathways are completely different. Mm -hmm. So either, likely in cancer, because I have seen some amazing reports that will take us 200 years to develop in rare diseases, that you have your, your genomic, you have your trials, you have everything that works for you. This is so far from reality, from the other side of the moon. So for us, for example, in rare diseases, fragmented. So you have one piece of data there, you have another piece of data there. Even the RMs that we try very hard to collect the data of our people, still, are, the resources are limited. And maybe move it a little further. Uh, we've seen these fantastic projects about data, i.e., data collection, fantastic. Where are the real-world evidence that we need? Where are the patient reported outcomes that we need? Because we said that we're going to use this data for research. Yeah, fantastic. When it comes to the pediatric committee that I torture every month, uh, and then we regulate the drug, it's out in the market. Who has access to it? Do you think that the data, the regulatory, for regulatory purposes, is used for access in rare diseases? No, it's a different question. Uh, so we, the one is the data sources, the pathways, but also what kind of data we need to collect, and we need to advocate to have real-world data, patient report outcomes, because this will build a pathway, a continuous pathway, from research to access. Because it's not, as I think David said, it's not about data. It's about access at the end, quality of life, survival of people. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I think this is um, mostly missing in, in the discussion around data, around artificial intelligence. It's really nice to share the data for research, but what exactly does that mean? Um, to be honest, for me as a patient, it's not enough to be told this is for research and this is good. Yeah, of course, but I want the facts, I want the insights, and I want to stay in the loop. So what, what happens exactly? What are we learning from our data? And uh, I want to be a part of, um, not just at the beginning, the, the donor of the data, but throughout the whole journey of the data. So is data a common good? Or is it a common good under certain conditions? And what would be, from your respective perspectives, the conditions for that? Do you want to start? I'm biased. So <laughs> that, we all are. We're going we to all get are. Into that. I'm very biased. Yes. I mean. <laughs> yeah. So I think that. Yeah, uh, air uh, is a common good, sun is a common good, everything is a common good, but everything has a price. Um, is the price the same 
for uh, the data collected from uh, five patients around the globe that have one disease, comparing to five people with diabetes? I don't think so. Um, is it, it has the same importance, even the ethics, as you said, in IE, to collect this data, it has the same value? I don't think so either. Uh, so I think there are various, uh, there is a granularity on, uh, on importance, in value, and most probably in, uh, in the availability, in the public domain, if it's a public asset. And if this asset is used, what this gives us in return. So if, imagine, for example, we have this fantastic health data space, uh, and you have a very small pocket of patients that you try to do research. So our industry partners don't have to pick up from the planet these 10 patients and try to collect the data and pay a lot of money to do so, and a lot of time to develop, but suddenly they have it in a box. Would this return on data uh, give us better pricing? Maybe we can discuss in the Q&A with our industry partners. <laughs> I assume that if you provide something, you take something in return. This is sustainability, maybe. Um, to be honest, I think that data should be a common good. Um, I think that there is too much discussion about a monetary value of data. I truly think data should never ever equal money. Because if data equals money, then the, the companies uh, or people with most of the money can buy the data and keep it for them and drive their innovation and maybe share it or maybe don't share it. So um, I really like the approach to, to see it as a common good um, and that we, let's say, all can use it and access it and drive innovation because um, only if also you know, diverse people have access to data, then we can be sure that um, all the perspectives are included. Maybe I can uh, tease my Go speaker. Ahead. <laughs> Sorry Go for ahead. being up. So you are for the open model, yeah. so everything is open. Yeah. Then we'll have the question, who is paying for this sustainability? Where the money comes? Yeah, well, I mean, the, um, in, within the European strategy, there are ideas around that. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Data Governance Act, for example, there is the plan to establish new organizations, so-called data intermediaries, and basically their job is to collect the data and to distribute the data. Um, and also within this regulation, um, it's already clear that they are not allowed to, you know, sell this data. Um, but of course, they are allowed to um, charge the service. And as far as I understood it, but of course I'm not a legal expert here, is that um, if you are a micro, small or medium company, you really just have to, the maximum amount you have to pay is uh, the costs which are created um, for the data intermediaries to, to share that data. So um, I think this is a new kind of business model which um, makes sure that data is available in the end for, for everyone. And we don't have to think about um, how to benefit monetarily from, from the data. I think we have a divergence of views between our two panelists. So if I understand correctly, the answer to the question who pays is not always the same as the answer to the question who benefits from data. Should the use of data in AI generate profits for anyone and for whom? Mm -hmm. Dimitrios? I think it depends on the model uh, we envision. And I think it depends also mm -hmm. on the need and the competition. So, uh, as I said, I, mm. I th and I'm not talking about monetary value. I'm talking about okay. value in general, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I think that as, for example, we have waivers for some high unmet need areas, I think this should be also applied. So you need motives. Uh, uh, should apply also on, on data. But uh, since we want to collect the data, and I really, uh, I think we, we have solved the 
problem of the planet, the echo. If we are altruistic, we live in a better planet. So I assume the same pattern will happen with the data. I think we should have a benefit, a value proposition for each one. So if somebody will donate his data, I don't know, for one euro, then it's okay with me. If this will save lives. Uh, because I, I, like, I really love the ethical considerations, but I like leaving people more, so... Yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> um, maybe, I think we have to differentiate here. I 100% agree, and I'm now talking <laughs> about monetary value. If there's, let's say there is um, a startup or a company developing medical software which includes an, an uh, AI system. Of course, they're allowed, allowed, uh, they have to charge for their product. But um, I think we have to discuss um, on what level should the monetization happen. And my point of view is mm -hmm. that it should not happen um, on the data and also not on the AI model because this is just some code. But of course, if the service is good, if the outcome of their product is good, then sure, people are happy to pay for that. I'm going to step back from that and I have um, maybe one or two more questions before we can start the Q&A because I'm full of questions. Um, as data is used in training artificial intelligence tools, what are the key things to keep in mind in terms of what makes data good quality? Does, because I imagine that there is no such thing as good quality MI without good quality data fed into it, but what are the key things that need to happen for that data to be of good quality? Would you like to start? Yeah, there? I mean, um, I'm, I'm not a data scientist, but what, what I can say from, from, from my perspective um, as a patient is um, the, the data set in which was used to train an AI system, does it really include all the different kind of people? So let me get a bit more specific. Um, let's say we have a person with breast cancer, because this is my area of expertise, so to say. Um, and we want that the, that the AI system helps to the pathologist to understand correctly what specifics does this cancer have. So is it hormone dependent? Uh, are there certain mutations, you know? And in order to, to train an AI system, you have to, um, you have to, you have to give it a various um, data set with uh, basically image data, which has that information on it. And now, in order to answer your question, is the data good quality or not, I would ask you, um, did it include various types of people? So regarding age, regarding ethnicity, um, is so how was the data collected? Um, yeah, I think that are the first things coming to my mind. Do you have something to add? And of course, you're coming from a, an environment where the patient population is not that high. So what is yeah. high But I was thinking, you? because I'm related uh, to your advocacy pathway lately, although I stay in rare diseases, uh, I think it's also very interesting what you said about the representative, uh, rep representative oh, sorry, the representation of data. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> My Greek are hitting up on me. So, um, because we, we see the different phenotypes and clinical outcomes and the DNA variables that affect even such a big, let's say, population like breast cancer. And we can only uh, imagine what this means for the other conditions. So, uh, inclusiveness is everything. Uh, but at least from the other side, when we try to collect our data uh, from the real world, let's say, experience <laughs> about to train our uh, artificial intelligence agents and uh, our, uh, in silico development machines, it is very simple things that affect us. So one is standards. The other is the way that you collect the data. The other is if you have different scanners, 
And if this information is translated to a common standard that all the AI machines will understand. Uh, you know, very, very, very simple things. I mean, we try to collect some data from, uh, from a Dutch hospital. I mean, you can imagine what happens to Greece. And they said, yeah, we'll send you the fax. We didn't have a fax to receive it. Uh, yeah, so fantastic, the super big uh, models we have. But if you go down to the ground, and to the various centers we all have in our, you know, back, <laughs> back door, uh, small little hospitals, doctor's office, etc. I think we'll find a lot of, uh, you know, skeletons in the closets, and we have to build a smart enough system that can translate these little bones to something meaningful. So, standardizing, centralizing, and having a very clear set of rules on how you collect and what you collect, and how, co how you validate the correctness of what you collect is, uh, is critical, at least from my perspective. You're 100% correct. I just want to add, for example, um, coming back to my um, example with the image data, in order to use to train it, uh, to train an AI model, you have to, you know, you have to, a pathologist in the end has to label the data. So um, I think it's all about standards, but it's also, you know, um, humans are involved, so I think it's not that easy, you know, to say, yeah, we now unify everything, we go with the structure. Um, every human has his or her experience and maybe labels it a little bit different. It does. That's why standards are important. What about importing bias into AI? Is that um, a real concern or is that a philosophical, ethical concern? Oh, it's definitely yes. not. There is a lot of research out there that um, also um, AI models, which are al already uh, approved, for example, from the FDA in the US, um, are full of biases. Um, and one reason for that, at least that's my theory, <laughs> is if the data you know, is, is not open, it is not a common good, then we don't know what data exactly was used to train the AI model, and I, I don't think that it's always, um, you know, a bad intent, but we all have our biases, as we <laughs> also mentioned, as we sit here, we have our biases, so um, also the people collecting the data, preparing the data, training the model, they all have the, their biases, um, and so I think it's a logical consequence that um, the bias is included into the model. I think uh, I've been very covered by the discussion. Maybe about the biases of the ethic part of the AI, I would like to, to see what you think. <laughs> um, well, we're, we're actually having so much fun that, um, that I think I will take a little break now. And I have one more question for you, which we can take as a final question. But I'm opening the floor to questions from our participants. So raise your hand if you'd like to ask something. One, two, three, four. Um, can colleagues with microphones bring microphones, please, for participants? Thank you. Uh, we can start over here. I think the hand in the front was first, and then, yeah. The four that remain alive at the end of the first day. <laughs> Brave. <laughs> Hello, it's a very interesting discussion. I'm Isabel Proaño from the European Federation of Allergies and Airways Diseases Patients Organizations. And I have here a report open because we just uh, launched the survey um, with uh, over 1,000 patients about digital health. And um, I just wanted to uh, ask you a question related to one of the findings. That is that uh, when asked about their motivations for sharing their health data digitally, more than 70% of patients say, first, to improve my condition, second, to develop new drugs and therapies, and third, early warning of deterioration, which is clearly linked with artificial intelligence. So I wanted to ask you, linked to this, how can patients be informed about how artificial intelligence is really operating in their treatment and daily lives? How would you advise that this is done, because I think right now it's not, uh, not, not very uh, known. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, first of all, I think, I mean, I'm sure there 
are some examples, but I'm not aware of so many products which already include artificial intelligence. So I think there is a, a huge gap between the innovation we in theory already have and the implementation in the, um, well, in the, in the hospitals and, and, and within um, general practitioners, for example. So um, it, that doesn't answer your question, but it, I think it shows the problem as well, because um, we're talking about AI systems um, and how we should explain it to each other, but um, we're far from implementing them. So um, I think the question then would be, um, how can we close that gap between what's possible and um, what's implemented? No, no, I fully agree. What's feasible, you know, at, at the end? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because we have heard a lot of promo, and maybe I will pick from your uh, fantastic research and some other point that the first question, the first answer, 70 something percent, it's what's there for me. So it will improve my condition. It's not that, yes, I'm going to save the planet. That was the second option. And the third one, it was the risk. So what the future will bring to me. So it's also an added for me. So uh, we have to make sure that all the proposals we try, or the advocacy we do for the IE, is that it makes sense to the people. They have to see a direct benefit. Uh, I think this is what, uh, what's more impressive. Because I haven't heard this uh, you know, today from uh, most of our stakeholders. I just heard about our uh, endless altruism. Uh, yeah. And maybe just coming back to your question. Um, so again, I would overall say it's all about um, transparency and openness. Um, because if we know what's in it, then maybe we are not afraid of it, you know? So. Um, and again, I'm coming back to the point post both of us um, mentioned, keep, keep us in the loop. Um, so it's not done with patients, give us your data and everything will be fine. It's about, um, okay, so what have we learned now from the data? I really want to know. Um, and maybe I can just add, because I, I read a very <laughs> interesting article a few days ago in, in I think it was Wired or so, and uh, the headline was, um, we should burn the, the consent form. Um, and I found that very interesting, not just catchy, because um, the idea was, now what we do is, we let the patient sign the consent that he or she gives the data for medical research. And here the idea is more, why don't we see this moment of giving consent as a start of a relationship, a relationship between the patients and the researchers, so that there is an ongoing interaction between all of us in form of a community, for example. You know, that um, there are events, there are possibilities to ask questions, there are the option to get updates on the new insights. Um, I mean, this could be, I think, good for all of us. And if the moderator allows us? Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. I think <laughs> it's also very interesting what you said, because mm -hmm. uh, the, the point is also what is used for, because who is setting the, the questions to the AI? So we're building it for whom? So for me, at least, it would be very interesting to answer questions that we want the answers to, not everybody else. And if you find the question relevant and you want the answer, then it's definitely much easier. So the research question should be relevant to us, like the outcomes, etc., that we said. And I, I remember that uh, we, we argued in our community six-minute walk test. So if you walk, if your child walks 350 meters or 450 meters or 315, and this is a fantastic outcome, but my child just wants to go for one step in order to get inside the school. We don't care about 350 meters above 300 meters. And then you get drugs approved on that. So, uh, patient, re re patient relevant research, I think we're getting there, we're very far from there. But maybe uh, also the questions in the IE is things that are important for us. Thank you. I'll take another question. I'll take another question. Hands up. Go ahead. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Sergio. I work for a company that uh, at QBI we work with data, and uh, and I am a data passionate. Uh, so I I would like to understand your opinion on this uh, discourse that is already out there on the democratization of data, and and moving from the consent and the clinicians or the hospitals owning the data, or being the repository of your data, to you through technology as patient, having the option every time that someone wants to use your data for a proper purpose, you can kind of reconsent with the use of technology and see exactly what your data is going. Uh, the monetization could be a different discourse or not, or donation, but what is your opinion around that? And before you answer, because there were four hands up, maybe we can collect all the questions, if that's okay. And there was another uh, hand up in the back, and another one I thought in the front, uh, but if you want, yes. Uh, Julie? Uh, Julie, in the first table, in the front. So, um, yes, and I will take both questions, and then, and then we will wrap up, because time, and we'll be kicked out of the room soon. <laughs> I'm sure they will. So go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so what I understand is that there is a gap between the collection of the data and the total outcome. And there are a lot of differences and a lot of factors that aren't paid attention to. Each patient is different, each disease is different, but not only the disease, each patient using difficult devices or difficult, different um, pills or like medicines and stuff like that. So when are collecting the data, even private companies, are they, do they have an algorithm that um, see all these differences or they just want an outcome that they don't even know what they want as an outcome? And do, is there like a World Health Organization, is there a world data organization, that would be very good because private companies might not have the best outcome and me as a patient, not me because I don't mind, but a patient might not want to give their data to a pharmaceutical company or a private company because they say like they want to create something for them and not just use it to for the general good. But if there is an organization for data collection, even in Europe, if it's for only for Europe, then the outcome would be something that we've never imagined, even in rare diseases, because it's rare for Greece, it's rare for England. But if we have a world data, then there are many people, like many data that we can see the outcomes. So I think there is a gap between the start and the final thing. Yeah. Thank you. And the last question? Um, I'll try to be very brief. Do you think there is a mechanism by which we are stopping algorithms from proposing decisions that impact patients for which they didn't have data to start with to learn on? What, what I'm trying to say is, and Demetrios was very clear, if the problems, if the data that patients find are relevant are not in the system and that's where the algorithm learns, how do we stop an algorithm from ma making recommendations that would impact those things? I don't know the answer, but I'm curious to know if you have one. So we have three questions. I don't think you can take them all, but perhaps all in a single answer because they go in, in fairly uh, different directions. So we have one, it's about the democratization of, of data and how does the whole monetization of it uh, work. Um, the one is how do we manage the variety and is there... Um, a world data organization that can can manage that. And then the third is how do we, if I understand correctly, the question would be how do we improve the machine learning so that if it makes mistakes, it stops making the mistakes? No. Perhaps you understood it better. <laughs> so, well, so. Well, maybe yeah. I'll start yeah, with start. this question and uh, I hope yeah. I, I understood it correctly. But um, so far, mm. what I understood from the AI Act, <clears throat> so different regulation, mm. that there should be um, 
some kind of regulative body which is able to withdraw AI systems that are not, um, or they, which are making um, harmful decisions. At least that's what I understood. Maybe um, this is just an idea and not yet sure how it works in, in real life then, but at least that's what I understood and I think that that would be an important mechanism to, to enable such, uh, such a regulatory body. Um, maybe the empowerment and the data organization, because I think that goes hand in hand. Um, also from a European perspective, and as I mentioned, there is planned to establish such data organization, more of them. There should be many data organizations, data intermediaries, and you as an individual can then choose um, Similar like you choose your bank, even if I don't want to compare it with a banking system, but you choose a, um, a bank you trust, and in the future you're able to, to choose a data intermediary you are trusting. Um, because, um, I don't know, because of the, um, they are very clear in their value proposition, um, and they say they are very strict with who is then allowed to access the data. So, um, this is the plan that there is a whole system of, of data organizations and you as an individual will have the choice to, to choose which one you like to work with. Um, so this is, then comes to the democratization and empowerment to the patient. So you don't have to make the decision every time a new company or research institution wants to access your data, um, but you, you trust this data intermediary once, and of course you can withdraw that, um, and this data organization then makes the decision for you who gets access to the data and who not. I don't like to have access, to have an organization to decide who makes access to my data. Yeah. That would like me to decide who makes access to my data. But that's personal. Yeah. Uh, but for uh, Christophe, uh, I think that the four diagnoses you get the rare diseases are wrong. So, yeah, I can live with some wrong eye. You know, I couldn't fight the doctors either. Uh, so I think validation, continuous validation of the models, very uh, high scrutiny and uh, recalibration is the solution. Uh, I don't think we even have models that uh, really are uh, so impactful in AI at this point in the decision making that I will say more medical mistakes than AI mistakes. Let's try to, to, to merge this. Uh, I love the World Data Organization. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how real it is, but maybe it will be. And uh, Sergio, uh, democratization, I will start to burning the informed consent. I think our ethics will love it. Because I can imagine what informed consent you are giving the moment you are going for an almost near-death experience in a surgery, and they tell you, yes, please sign this. Mm, consenting. Uh, consenting also for uh, prior to treatment SMA2, uh, SMA1, 16 months of life expectancy. Consenting. Uh, you will consent a lot. Uh, so, dynamic informed consent is something. This is something different, which you can redraw at any point. Uh, and when we're talking about democratization, uh, at least I'm said very biased because this is what we're doing to send anyway. So, we have our data, uh, to send data platform, which is a locker that each patient has his own data. He can give access to the clinician he wants. He can redraw, he can correct, but his own data. He's the master of his data. And actually, with artificial intelligence, you can also compare yourself, how to the other children are doing, how the centers, your center is doing. You know, this is for the future. But the future is now. And uh, for me, it's a very black and white option. Sorry for that. And maybe IQVIA can help, who knows, in the democratization, right? <laughs> can I add something? You can add one more thing, but then we okay. need to move okay. to the I promise. It's, it's, it's the last thing. Just, um, just something you said, um, and to your question, um, I think the, the ongoing optimization should, again, include the patient perspective. So, um, in my ideal world, um, the patients are part of the, let's say, not just the whole product development process, but also um, then the ongoing evaluation. 
So this could be, for example, happen with a patient board or um, with a, a chief patient officer role within companies, you know, a role that makes sure that it's not just a discussion at the beginning and then everybody forgets, yeah, there was something with ethics at the beginning, but now we just have our product. But this, that this person or this board can make sure that this is an ongoing um, discussion and evaluation. Maybe to add on that very fast. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I cannot really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you're uh, free to go. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I think the one part is uh, that we already regulate drugs as patients. So, we have the committees of EMA patient representatives. I think we can manage data. So, it's out of the question. Uh, the second part is uh, that when it comes to how you can say it, how, how the future would look like. Uh, I think the future is looking bright, as long as, uh, as David said, uh, we make it our own business. It's our data, it's our business, and we should claim it. Thank you. So, he, he, you can tell that we've managed to, um, to have a good conversation before, because you answered my question before I actually asked it. <laughs> my question was going to be, <laughs> Uh, if, if I may, what does the future look like? So actually, actually, I was actually <laughs> saving time, you see? So you saved me time. No, uh, uh, ser seriously now. So you're, my question is, how far are we from what the future should look like and what needs to happen to get there? And because you stole my thunder, Dimitrios, I will give the floor to Victoria first. <laughs> <laughs> But it was already a perfect answer. <laughs> um, how far are we away? I don't know if this is how we should close this discussion. Um, what needs to happen then? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I really would, would um, repeat what you said. Let's try to get involved. And I really mean it. I really mean it. And I think this is also what we heard at the beginning of the day. Patients need to get involved. If we don't get involved, if we don't make this our problem, then nobody will do it for us. So um, I think it, there's a, a lot of stuff has to happen because if we should get involved, then they need the possibility to do so. Um, but also the, the, what is it called? The data competence to do so. Right, so there are a lot of steps we have to to take, um, but I think it's worth trying because the possibilities are the possibilities are huge for our benefit. I love finishing on the word benefit. Uh, so, is there anything that you'd like to add as a final word, Dimitrios? Fantastic. No, it's a joke. <laughs> no, no, uh, I fully, I fully agree with the comment. Uh, I think we are closer. I don't know if we are close enough, but we are closer, and every every moment we are closer. Maybe we can uh, we get closer, even closer, because we have a fantastic uh, participation of all our stakeholders. We can get closer if uh, some of our data holders, high quality data holders, can support the patient efforts, even if it is industry partners, if it is academic partners. This is something we can solve together. And definitely we have to negotiate with the commission and every policy maker to push a little faster. Thank you very much and thank you everyone for staying with us. Uh, thank you very much, Victoria Prantauer, Dimitrios Atanasiu, I can pronounce your name. And um, well, I think with this we close the day and we will pass the microphones. Let's sit here for now. We will pass the microphones to our lovely hosts to tell us what happens next. Yes, oh. thank you so, so much. <laughs> thank you so, so much for this lively discussion. You know, a session is good when it's so quiet, even five minutes past the ending time. Everyone is so attentive. I think we could have listened to you for 60 more minutes. So for tomorrow, we will be starting at 9 with a plenary session on the patient organization's role in driving the work on real-world data and real-world evidence. We will discuss a lot more about data governance and data journey. Again, we will have parallel sessions on digital 
um, technologies to address health inequalities. We will also talk about how can we support the patient data journey through the healthcare system to build public trust. And we will have a closing session on digital health governance and then a call for action and closing session from Anka, actually, and a goodbye lunch, which will be very good to have some last networking. And talking about meals and eating, what is the last program for today? For anyone uh, that's here, we're going to have dinner very soon at uh, 7.30 p.m. But we would also like to sincerely thank everyone that joined these sessions online. You can also join us tomorrow to continue this debate and the recordings will also be available online. But for today, I think we can say good night. Yeah, thank you. See you at 7.30 in this very room, I believe, for the cocktails and gala dinner. Uh, the cocktail is in the room, okay. Sounds fancy. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>